All right. Uh, yeah, I start now. So hi, everyone. My name is Mehdi. Uh, I'm a PhD student in physics at MIT. I study quantum computing. I did my undergrad in uh, electrical engineering and physics at Sharif University in Tehran. And, uh, you know, back in undergrad, I couldn't make up my mind whether I want to study physics or electrical engineering in grad school. So uh, I decided to do quantum computing, which is an interdisciplinary uh, major. It lies in the intersection of physics, computer science, and E. And if you have background in uh, any of these majors, it, it's really helpful. And today in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, quantum computers and why we think they're powerful. Uh, and I think I start by telling you about some challenges that we face today. Uh, and then I tell you how we think quantum computers can help us address these challenges and why computers that we already have are not uh, very suitable for this purpose. So for example, we need better batteries. Uh, this would allow us to store renewable energy at a scale or to reshape transportation industry, for example, by using more electric cars. We also need better solar cells. So these days, the efficiency of solar panels is like 30 to 40 percent. And it would be very impactful if we could improve this efficiency uh, a little bit. We also need better fertilizers. And we need more efficient ways of producing them. So right now, about like 1 to 2 percent of world energy consumption is used for a specific chemical process known as nitrogen fixation that uh, produces fertilizers. So the, this nitrogen fixation is also carried out in nature by microorganisms living in soil. And it's much more efficient than uh, you know, what we artificially do in industry. So nature has found a way to you know, do this much better than what we do. And the key to her success is uh, using uh, like a specific enzymes or like catalysts. So these catalysts are molecules that increase the rate of a chemical reaction without undergoing any permanent chemical change themselves. So it would be uh, very useful if we could engineer such catalysts, such molecules to use them in industry. Or for example, we need like faster, more accurate drug discovery so that we can cure more diseases more efficiently and faster. So, you know, these are like very like different type of challenges and you might ask what they have in common. Uh, and if you think about it, you see that in order to address them, we need to understand molecules that are very large. They consist of thousands of atoms. We need to be able to engineer such molecules and study their properties. But how can we study them? Well, you have one option, which is go to lab and synthesize these molecules, make them, and then measure their properties. You can also avoid that. You can just simulate these molecules, meaning that you, for example, write a computer program that solves a bunch of equations and it tells you uh what these molecules do so you can run it on your computers which we call classical to distinguish it from quantum computers that i'm going to talk about or you can run your code on a quantum computer so you might ask well what is the difference between these methods why can't i just like go in lab and make them why do i even need to simulate or if i'm simulating why do i need like a quantum computer why can't i just run it on my laptop so it turns out that it's very hard to synthesize uh, molecules in lab. It's expensive and it's time consuming. And even if you manage to do that, it's not clear if you have the right like combination of atoms or molecules and maybe you need to tweak them a little bit or change the properties and then you need to like do this from scratch. So it's not really like practical to do this for all such molecules in lab. 
And then in the rest of this talk, I'll try to explain why if you try to simulate this instead on your laptop or any other classical computer, this is still will be re really time consuming. So it's not feasible. But on the other hand, quantum computers, like a good quantum computer will be capable of simulating very complicated molecules. So it kind of can help us answer you know, the questions that I told you about in the beginning of my talk. So I start by telling you about why classical computers won't be able to simulate complicated molecules in a short amount of time. And, you know, like a molecule with thousands of atoms is like a complicated object. So let's simplify things a little bit. And instead of the whole molecule, let's focus on one atom among all of these atoms. And you might already know that atoms consist of electrons and like a nucleus, and they interact with each other. And when I say simulate, I mean, uh, okay, so from quantum mechanics or from physics, we know how these electrons and nuclei interact with each other. We have a set of equations that if you solve, you will be able to predict the location and other like properties of this system. So by simulating on a computer, they mean you try to solve those equations that you get from physics and then try to see what's going on with these objects. And you know, like even an atom is a complicated thing, you know, there are like charged particles, electrons and nuclei, they're all interacting with each other. So let's simplify things even more and let's, ignore the interactions and just look at one electron. So I want to ask a very simple question, which is what is the location of the electron at a given time? So is it like here, here, or here? Right, it's like a very simple question. But I make it even more trivial and I make it like into a very simple question. Is the electron on the left or on the right? Right, like this is like a very trivial question. And if you ask from classical physics perspective, the answer is that, well, the electron is like either on the right or it's on the left. And if I want to tell you which of these cases the electron is in, I just tell you a number. I give you zero when I want to tell you the electron is on the left and one when I want to say it's on the right. And then I put like some funny notations around them, like a line and an angle to distinguish them from like, other zeros and ones so that we all know we're talking about like I'm using these numbers to represent the location of the electron. So you might already know that we call a number which is either zero or one a binary digit or a bit for sure. So as we see you need one bit to determine the location of one electron. Is, is it on the left or on the right? How about two electrons? Well the answer is still simple two electrons are both either on the left, which I show by zero, zero, I give you these two numbers, or one of them is on the left, one of them is on the right, and so on, right? And then again, I put these like notations around them, and you see that I need two bits to determine the location, I need two zeros and ones. And then you can think about three electrons, and you see that we need three bits, and for n electrons, we need n bits. So if I draw a diagram like this, that on the horizontal axis we have the number of electrons and on the vertical we have the number of bits we need to determine the location of the electron. Uh, so we have for one electron you need one bit, then you need two bits, three and so forth. And this function is just a linear function and we say the number of bits needed to represent the location of the electrons grows linearly meaning if you double the number of electrons, you double the number of bits. So, so far everything is simple. And uh, let's ask the same trivial question uh, when we have quantum mechanics. So we know that an electron is a microscopic object and it's governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. And then the answer to this very simple question is actually uh, quite strange. So you might have heard in the previous talks uh, last week that 
the electron can be in superposition. It can be simultaneously on the right or on the left. When you look at it, sometimes it's on the left, sometimes you find it on the right. So it seems the question is not really if the electron is on the left or right, it's how much it is on the left, how much it is on the right. So for example, it could be all on the left, or it could be all on the right, or it could be something in between. So for example, it could be more on the left than right, in which case I'm like using these numbers, 0.8, which is greater than 0.6, to uh, show that it's more on the left. But these numbers are arbitrary. You could like use other things. Or it could be the other. It could be more on the right. So we call such an object, which is in a superposition of 0 and 1, it could be anything between 0 and 1, a quantum bit or a Q bit for sure. So we see that we need two numbers to uh, specify like the state of a qubit, that what, that what configuration of 0 and 1 that qubit is in. So how about two electrons? So you might ask, you might answer, well, it's true that uh, they can be in superposition, but I just need to tell you what superposition the first one is in and what superposition the second one is, right? So then I told you the state of these two electrons. I uh, fully specified the location of these two electrons. But this also turns out not to be the case. So two electrons can be entangled, meaning you can't address them individually, you need to represent them as a whole. And if you reveal the location of one of the electrons, it might affect the location of the other one. So they're somehow correlated. You can't really like, talk about them individually. And I'll draw like some lines like this to remind us that these two electrons are entangled. And then similar to the to what we did for superposition. Now you have four possibilities. Two electrons can be both on the left or right or something in between. And I need to tell you how much of each of these possibilities uh, I might have. So I need to give you numbers. And you see that for two qubits, I have four of these possibilities. So I give you four numbers. And then I, if I have three electrons, then I have eight of these possibilities, right? Each one of them is uh, either left or right, so there are two, and then two times two times two is eight. And I need to give you eight numbers to specify three qubits. And then again, you can convince yourself that for n electrons, for n qubits, I need two to the n numbers. And if I draw the same diagram that we had before, you see that things are different. For one electron, I need two numbers. For two, I need four, then eight, then 16, then 32, so powers of two. And things are rapidly increasing, right? Like when I get to n, it's like two to the n. If n is like 100, two to the 100 is like a very huge number. And such a function that grows very rapidly is called an exponential function. And we say that the number of possibilities for the location of n electrons grows exponentially. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, there's a few. All right, so this was just for qubits. So remember that we simplified things a lot. We ignored the interactions. Now, if you go back to your atom, you see that you know things are even more complicated because electrons and nuclei are interacting. And then this is just an atom in like a giant molecule. So you need to store gigantic numbers of possibilities and things to simulate a molecule. And then even if you do that, if any of you like generate these numbers, then you need to store that you know in your computer and then process it and then like change them and add them together and like do things on them. And well, naturally it's a classical computer would have a hard time processing and storing these gigantic number of things. So this kind of shows why it's a very hard thing and time consuming to simulate uh, microscopic objects such as molecules on your laptop, for example. But you might ask, well, 
it seems nature is kind of forcing us to use like these very big numbers and you know it's like very hard to work with them so how can a quantum computer get around this problem so the key to the success of the quantum computer is that uh, a quantum computer can control and manipulate qubits directly instead of first turning them into bits and then working with bits. So in other words, qubits are the building blocks for quantum simulation. And if you have enough of them, it turns out that you can simulate the you know, behavior of more complicated objects such as like atoms and molecules. So this simplification, simplification that we did like to go from atoms to, from molecules to atoms and then to qubits is not like that uh, bad of an approximation. You can still approximate the simulate the effect of more complicated things by working with qubits directly. And we don't try to use bits and process them and we just directly work with qubits so again qubits are microscopic objects that can be in superposition or they can be entangled and it seems now it's like a fair game we are simulating objects meaning atoms molecules and other things that themselves are entangled or they could be in superposition with qubits and qubits are also uh, they can be entangled or in superposition. So it's like you're, fight, like you're simulating nature using nature, or like you're simulating quantum mechanics with quantum mechanics. So one thing, for example, that a quantum computer might do is to start with a bunch of qubits, and they're all in like a very simple configuration in the beginning. For example, all your electrons are on the left. There is no superposition, there is no entanglement. And your goal is to simulate something more complicated. And what you have is a, that you have the ability to choose one of these qubits and put it in superposition or like make two qubits entangled. So for example, you can take this one, put it in superposition. You can take these two and put them like in an entangled state and so forth. And at the end of your computation, you get a more complicated state. And I don't tell you exactly why, but this is enough to study like other uh, naturally occurring problems. So in practice, quantum computers use different microscopic objects as their qubits. It's not that you have an electron, you know, which is either on the left or right. You, you could use atoms. And you do that in ion trap quantum computing, or you could use pair of electrons in like superconducting quantum computing. And there are like different architectures for uh, doing quantum computation. So for example, in ion trap, you have a bunch of atoms, you align them, and then you shine laser at them. And these laser beams are somehow doing that process of putting qubits in superposition or making them entangled. So, right, so uh, hopefully I've explained why we think quantum computers are kind of the right approach when you want to simulate complicated molecules and why your laptop won't be able to do that and why like, going to lab and trying that is also not feasible. But there are other applications for quantum computing. Not only you can simulate uh, molecules, you can search faster. So if you have like a database or if you have like a specific problem which needs you to search over uh, some objects, you can search faster if you have a quantum computer than like a classical computer. You can factor numbers into uh, prime numbers. And this is useful for uh, cryptography applications for like breaking passwords and things like that. But not all problems run faster on a quantum computer. And it's a research question, what quantum computers do better? And people like me are trying to uh, figure that out. And I hope that the answer will not only have some practical benefit 
but also might explain uh, you know what's going on with the wacky form of information processing that is allowed by uh, the laws of quantum mechanics. So it's an exciting time for quantum computing these days. We'll see the first generation of these computers soon. Right now, there are noisier version of them with like a small number of qubits available, but they're not capable of uh, solving very useful problems. But still, they're good enough that they can achieve what's called quantum supremacy. So in quantum supremacy, uh, a quantum computer can solve a useless problem. It doesn't have any practical application in a short amount of time, like a few minutes. But the best uh, supercomputer in their world uh, will not be able to solve the same problem in a reasonable time. So this performing this experiment, so this is like an experiment. If you, if you actually do this, then uh, you show that quantum computers are kind of superior compared to classical computers. They're capable of doing something that the best uh, supercomputer that is working with like classical physics won't be able to do that. And uh, this is uh, this experiment has been done recently, and uh, we're about to see uh, the outcome of that. Uh, right. So I think with that. I finish my talk. I'll let you ask me any question. Did you hear that? I didn't. So are you okay if we just keep the camera off for Q and A and we keep recording? And we sure. listen. Okay. Um, you guys have any questions for him? It can be about the talk or it can be about his experience at MIT or school in general, the field that he's in. Yeah. Did you hear that? I didn't. Um, what other things can a quantum computer process that's not a simulation? Uh, right, so do they still see my slides? Yeah. Right, so let's see if I can get back. So there are like a few other known applications that we have like a mathematical proof for that, that a quantum computer can solve something or like, uh, you know, perform, performs a computation faster than a classical computer. So one of them is uh, searching. So by search, I mean, say, there is an object. So I give you a set of objects and I want you to find one of them that has a specific property that I tell you. So I give you like a bunch of say balls and they're like either red or blue. And then I uh, want you to find like a red ball or something like that. So one way to do this is just you will go through all the balls and then you see if there's a red one or not, right? So it turns out that a quantum computer can uh, perform this in a shorter amount of time. Or one other application is that, uh, so the way your phone works or the way your uh, computer connects to, I don't know, your bank account and things like that, there are specific protocols based on uh, hard problems that we know uh, it's very hard for somebody else that doesn't know your password, for example, to break into your account, right? So there are like a specific protocols designed by like, uh, based on, ma based on uh, certain mathematical problems that we know are very hard to break. Uh, and one of them is factoring into prime numbers. So I, I think I want to explain exactly how this is used in like uh, protocols that you know allows you to connect your to your bank uh, securely. But uh, there's this problem that I give you a number and I want you to factor it into its prime uh, factors. And then uh, 
this problem is very hard for classical computers to do. We don't know any algorithm that is capable of doing that, but a quantum computer can easily solve this in a short amount of time. So if we have a capable quantum computer, then we can uh, break some of these uh, security protocols. You know, those are not safe anymore. People should change them. And uh, yeah, I think these are like, uh, like the major things that we know quantum computers are capable of solving, but there is still this open problem as I mentioned that uh, what other problems are there that like a quantum computer might be able to solve more efficiently. Allie, question? Manny, why did you decide to go to MIT? Did you hear that? Uh, right. So I think MIT has a very good uh, group on quantum computing. Uh, so, you know, like the field of quantum computing is relatively small compared to other uh, branches of physics. Uh, and MIT has one of the, you know, leading groups in quantum computing. So, and I knew that I want to continue my uh, PhD in quantum computation and quantum information. So I decided to join MIT. And what, what do you do, Mehdi? Because we've heard from um, Adam and Teague who work on things like architecture and entanglement. So what do you do specifically? Right. Uh, so this is a story that I told you about how classical computers uh, can't really solve problems in like chemistry or physics. It's not like uh, all true in a sense that there are still ways to uh, solve some of these problems, not all of them, uh, with a classical computer. And that's what people are doing right now, right? So it's not that there is like no way at all uh, to solve some of these problems on normal computers. And then uh, one thing to do is to devise like uh, clever algorithms that allows you to simulate these complicated objects on normal computers. So we don't have a quantum computer yet, but we have a good classical computer. Your laptop is like a very good computer right now. Uh, so a part of what I do is to find such algorithms. Uh, and it's like a, it's not only practical in a sense that if you find such an algorithm, then well, you can run it and you can learn about nature. It also gives you insight about uh, what you're simulating in a sense that it's not by accident that some of these algorithms work and you are capable of simulating such systems on classical computers, but in order to find such algorithms, you need to very have a very good understanding of the system that you are trying to simulate. And this relates to deep problems in physics that, uh, you know, what properties these interacting many body uh, quantum systems have. And a part of what I do is to study these properties, understand them, and then use them to design algorithms for simulating these systems on current computers. Any other questions? No questions. Okay, thank you, Mehdi. You're welcome. Yeah. All right, so I should stop sharing, right? Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop the recording and.